Our Father, we thank you for these days of study, preparation, and expectation. We do praise your name because of the promise you have given to the church. We are called by your name. We are washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. And because we are purchased by that blood, Father, we are expecting that the promise of the Father, which you have given to the church, will be ours in Jesus' name. As we study these chapters and these verses, we are praying that the blessings hidden within them will be ours in the name of Jesus Christ. Lead us in our study. Empower us with your spirit and enlighten us with the light of the gospel. Teach us what we ought to know in these verses that we study today. In Jesus' name we pray. Last Monday we started the study of the Acts of the Apostles. And we have already studied verses 1 to 11. As Jesus was having the last meeting with his own apostles and disciples, I told you last week he gave them the pertinent message after he had given them the personal manifestation of himself after his resurrection. And then he gave them the promised might. After that, they were asking him a question about the kingdom to come, whether he will now restore that kingdom unto Israel. And he told them that was a prophetic mystery. They were not to know that. Then he gave them the purposeful mission. As he told them, they will receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost is come upon them. And they will be witnesses unto him both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost part of the earth. And then after that, he was taken away from them the proper motive. Because that was the motivation that will keep them on the job that he had given them to do. But today we're looking at the verses that conclude the first chapter. And these verses come into the waiting period of the apostles and disciples as they waited for the power that Jesus, the Lord and Master, their Savior, had promised them. We may not quite appreciate the confusion that could have resulted because Jesus Christ had gone. But I'll try to open the scriptures to you for you to understand and appreciate the situation in which the disciples were at this time. Jesus had been personally present with them for about three and a half years. They had lived with him, ate with him. They had done all the deeds spiritually right in the personal presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. This was the first time they were left alone to themselves to plan, to organize, and to hold a prayer meeting where they would not see Jesus Christ face to face. So they had lost the personal presence, the physical presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. All they depended upon now was the promise he had given to them where two or three are gathered in my name. There I am in the midst of them. But they couldn't see him, feel him, or touch him. Neither could they speak directly to him. More than that, prayer had taken on a new dimension for them. You realize whenever they were troubled in the boat, they went to him, they tapped him, they touched him, and he would say, Master, carest thou not that will perish? They saw the Son of God that they wanted his help. They saw him, they spoke to him, they touched him, they felt his presence around. But this was the time now that they prayed without seeing Jesus Christ. They couldn't touch him except with their faith. They couldn't see him except by faith. Neither could they speak to him now except by faith. He now was in heaven and they were on earth. And this was the time that Jesus spoke about before he left, he said, Hitherto 
have ye asked nothing in my name? Now you must pray directly to the Father, and you pray in my name. Well, since you had been praying, you have been praying to God the Father, and you have been praying in the name of Jesus, even before you were born again, so you may not really understand what it meant for them, that they now closed their eyes for the first time, because in the past, they opened their eyes whenever they were talking to Jesus. But now for the first time, they might close their eyes, they might kneel down, they might stand up, they might sit down, and then talk to their father they couldn't see. And they will talk to him and ask for the benefit they were asking in the name of Jesus. It was so new to them that they were now praying in the name of the risen, glorified Jesus Christ, the Son of God. But then... There were 12 apostles before that Jesus chose. One of them had backsliding, and one of them had become an apostate. He had totally gone away from the Lord. In fact, now he had died. It was the talk of the town. All people were saying one of the apostles had gone away. And you know, everywhere they went, that shame was there. So you must understand now that they were, you know, going about with that shame upon them. Apart from that, there was the talk in town that the body of Jesus had been stolen by his disciples and that they are going to tell us that he is risen from the dead and therefore they were afraid of the Jews. Now you think of this small group in fear, in shame, and yet they were waiting for the promised power. And Jesus was not there to encourage and strengthen them. Now you begin to understand the situation in which they were. Now they wanted to know whether they must choose another person to replace Judas Iscariot. Again, it was a new experience. You'll remember at the time of the supper, when they were asking, Who will betray the Lord Jesus Christ? They saw him and they were asking, is it I? Is it I? They had Jesus Christ, we call him the living word, to ask. And they could tell, he could tell them what was the response. Or he could tell the disciple whom he loved most. And um, they could say, now you ask Jesus, who is he that will betray you? But now they had a question to ask, they couldn't see Jesus to ask him. And the question is... Should we choose another person to replace Judas Iscariot? But Jesus was not physically present to answer that question. For the first time now, they must go back to the scriptures. Which means they must go to the Old Testament to ask that question. They were asking the living word before Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Now they must ask the written word, the word of God about whether another person should be chosen or not and what time he should be chosen before the Holy Ghost comes or after the Holy Ghost comes. Now you understand the problem they had. And with that insight into the waiting period for the promised power, we must approach verses 12 to 26 and we see three major sections the submission of the disciples, the scriptures on a disciple, and the selection of a disciple. The submission, the scriptures, and the selection. And for the submission of these disciples, I read from verse 12 to verse 15. Acts chapter 1, verses 12 to 6 to 15. Then returned they unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet which is from Jerusalem a Sabbath day's journey. And when they were coming, they went up into an upper room where abode both Peter and James and John and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus and Simon Seloti and Judas the brother of James. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. And in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said, The number of the names together were about a hundred and twenty. Here we're introduced 
to the disciples and apostles after Jesus Christ had gone. And here we see them in total complete submission to the word of Jesus Christ. I told you before, and I've said it a number of times now, that he gave them a commandment in Acts chapter 1 verse 4, being assembled together with them, with his disciples and apostles. He commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait, but wait for the promise of the Father, which says he, ye have heard of me. He told them they must remain or wait or tarry in Jerusalem until the power will come upon them. The promise of the Father will be given to them. And he explains in verse 5, For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. He had given them the commandment to remain in Jerusalem and were told of their obedience if we're submitting to the Lord, our submission will be marked by obedience. He told them to wait in Jerusalem. And the only way they could show they were submissive to that word was to obey. Now, I told you before that these disciples were saved. But then they needed to be sanctified. And I gave you reasons why we know that they needed sanctification. One reason was this. Whenever they came together, except Jesus Christ was there with them, they had difficulty getting into agreement. There was argument. There was disagreement. Sometimes there was discord among them. They never could be able to reach a unanimous decision on their own without Jesus Christ telling them they lacked unity. And therefore, Jesus was praying for them, sanctify them, for the, through thy word, thy word is truth. And he said, you sanctify them so that they may be one. Now, you realize Jesus didn't tell them where to stay in Jerusalem. He only said, tarry ye in Jerusalem. They were 120 who decided they will obey that commandment to tarry in Jerusalem. And there was not a disagreement or argument about where to go. They all decided unanimously we're going to get to the upper room. That means something had happened to them. They agreed together and they were staying together in obedience to what the Lord had said. Look at that verse 12 again. Then returned day unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet. That's from the Mount of Olives. That's the place where Jesus went away. And it says, which is from Jerusalem a Sabbath day's journey. What does it Sabbath day's journey mean? At the time of the tabernacle worship in the Old Testament, the 12 tribes of Israel were supposed to pitch their tents around the tabernacle. Some in the west and some in the north, some in the south, some in the east of the tabernacle. Now, the children of Israel measured the, the greatest distance from the tabernacle. And you have to come from that farthest distance to come and worship in the tabernacle on the Sabbath day. And among the children of Israel, the farthest distance between the uh, farthest tent to the tabernacle became the measure of the journey you could go on the Sabbath day. And it was 2,000 cubits. You have one and a half feet, 18 inches in one cubit. So you have 3,000 feet in a Sabbath day's journey. That's 1,000 yards. You remember in primary school, 1,760 yards make a mile. 1,000 yards will be just above half of a mile. And so when it says they returned to Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey is telling you they just went 1,000 yards above half a mile between that place and Jerusalem. And here we read of their obedience. They really obeyed the Lord. They obeyed the commandment. Turn to Acts chapter 5. Verse 32, let's remember as we're waiting for the coming of the Holy Ghost, 
if we're going to receive that Holy Ghost upon our lives, one, we must be saved. Two, we must obey the Lord. And the obedience is not just a singular obedience. It's obedience in unity with the church. There are some people who can sing solo well, but they cannot sing with the whole choir. What I'm saying is that there are some people who say that they obey the Lord in isolation. The soloist obedience. But the Lord is looking for a combined obedience. You are able to wait with the church. You are able to stay with the church. You are able to obey along with the church. A unanimous obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ along with the whole body of Christ. And so you want to understand that as we are waiting for the Holy Ghost to come upon us. One of the conditions is that we will obey the Lord. And you know, you cannot fully obey the Lord, totally obey the Lord, unquestionably obey the Lord, wholeheartedly obey the Lord, and in unity with the church obey the Lord, except a deep work of grace has been done in your heart. In Acts chapter 5, verse 32. And we are his witnesses of these things. And so is also the Holy Ghost, whom God has given to them that obey him. The Holy Ghost, whom God has given to them that obey him. We obey, and the Holy Ghost will come upon us. Obedience is a condition. Now we go to Acts chapter 1, verse 13, and verse 14. And when they were coming, they went up into an upper room where abode both Peter and James and John and Andrew and Philip and Thomas and Bartholomew and Matthew and James the son of Alphaeus and Simon Celote and Judas, not his carrier, but Judas, the brother of James. These all continued with one accord. Underline that in your Bible. With one accord. Only three words, they are important words. With one accord. And thank God we have these people here. We have Peter here. We have James here. We have John here. Something that happened to them. You remember that before Jesus went away, James and John came and said, When that kingdom comes, we'll just like you to put one on the one side and the other on the other side. And Jesus said, You mustn't talk like that. When the ten heard it, they were filled with indignation. But we thank God because there was nothing like that here at this particular time. Place seeking had gone away. Pride had gone away. Disagreement had gone away. They were all now quietly together with one accord. Oneness. Unity of mind. Unity of purpose. Unity in the heart. And before the Holy Ghost can come upon us, there must be this unity. And you remember, this is exactly what Jesus Christ prayed for in John chapter 17. John chapter 17, from verse 17. Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself. I consecrate myself. I set myself apart. I dedicate myself, as to the cross of Calvary, that they also might be sanctified, completely dedicated unto the Lord and made holy, purified. Through the truth, neither prayer for this alone, but for them which also shall believe on me through their word. And why was he praying for their sanctification? Look at verse 21. That they all may be one. When we are sanctified, we will become totally united. And if you are finding it difficult to be united with the body of Christ, there's something in your heart kicking and you can't, you can't find it easy to be united with the body of Christ, well, you may be saved. If you are saved, you are not committing any outward external sin. But once this disunity is there, you are always seeing that you are always right and others are always wrong. You see that you are always better than other people. Therefore, it's difficult to be united with them. You see that when there is a case among you and the fellow believers, you know, they are just, uh, they can't see it right. They can't do it right. They can't act it right. Because, you know, you are the one that always sees the right thing and they are always wrong. 
Well, that means that you are the object of discord and disagreement. You are the object of disunity. And you know that you have been in another gospel church before. You couldn't get united with them. You were saved. You've come in here. You have said, I've come into a better church. After spending two weeks there, one month there, you find that you are disagreeing again. Well, the problem is, you need to be sanctified so that they all may be one. You know, in the house fellowship, you are in the house fellowship, you are saved, and we praise God for that. But you get into disagreement with the house fellowship members and with the house leader, with the area leader. Well, they just don't like me. I am good. God knows I am good. God knows I'm a child of God. God knows that I'm a fine believer, wonderful believer. But oh, I don't know why the thousands of people here are all wrong and I'm the only angel here that is right. Well, the Lord is telling you by that you need to be sanctified because you see, when you are sanctified, the Bible says that they all may be one. As thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me, and the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one. Wonderful. That they may be one. That they may be one. How? Even as we are one. You know, when you are really sanctified, it doesn't matter you are a graduate. You are not conscious of it anymore. That one is buried under the blood of Jesus Christ. You may have a wonderful car you are using. That's all right. But you see, you don't see that when you come into the fellowship. If you happen to be in the choir, you just submit. Whether you are a graduate or undergraduate or just an illiterate. Whether you are a man or a woman doesn't really matter. You have married, you have not married, doesn't really matter. When you have got really sanctified, you are united with the body of Christ. And it says in verse 23, I in them and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them even as thou hast loved me. And it says, they all continued with one accord. There was unity, there was oneness, and you know, it was unconditional oneness. What does that mean? Well, they didn't come together and say, we want James and John to come and apologize for wanting to seek the right hand side and the left hand side. Otherwise, we cannot be united with them. Until everybody that has offended me come, until they come to, you know, apologize. I cannot get in unity with them. It was unconditional. They didn't say, now, Peter, you have been the spokesman. You are too self-confident. And we know what happened when Jesus was to be crucified. Except you just, uh, you know, take a low seat. will not be united with you. And neither did they ask the brethren of Jesus. Because, you know, the brethren of Jesus, they are now converted. But we're told in John chapter 7 that neither did his brethren believe in him. At that time, they had not believed. But now they had believed. They did not tell them to take a lower siege. They were all just with one accord in one place. That's sanctification. You see, I don't know whether I'm, I mean, unity with the brethren or not. You don't know. Look at Isaiah chapter 11. Verse 13. Isaiah chapter 11. Verse 13. The envy also of Ephraim shall depart. You know, when there is unity, when there is oneness, envy shall depart. The adverse trees of Judah shall be cut off. Ephraim shall not envy Judah, and Judah shall not vex Ephraim. That's the unity we're talking about. The usher will not envy the member of the choir. The member of the choir will not envy the house fellowship leader. And the zona leader will not be jealous of the coordinator. And a person in charge of the building here will not be jealous of the person in charge of house fellowship. There will just be total unity and oneness and togetherness and fellowship and communion with the believers. And it doesn't matter what you are, who you are, whether you happen to, the, to be the foot in the fellowship, the hand in the fellowship, the eye in the fellowship, the mouth in the fellowship, whether you are a preacher or you lead the chorus, whatever you do, whether you are just a wonderful Christian, just come in to hear the word of God. There will be complete unity. 
unity, there will be no envy or jealousy. That's unity. And in Isaiah chapter 52, verse 8. Isaiah chapter 52, verse 8. Thy watchmen shall lift up the voice. With the voice together shall they sing. They shall see eye to eye. That's it. They shall see eye to eye. They shall see eye to eye. When the Lord shall bring against Zion. You don't know whether you are in unity with the body of Christ. You just ask the question, am I seeing eye to eye with them on repentance? Do I see eye to eye with them on restitution? Do I see eye to eye with them on the necessity of purity before power? Holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Do I see eye to eye with them that whosoever is born of God does not commit sin? Do I see eye to eye that we need the power of the Holy Ghost? Do I see eye to eye that the church of God should be together, worship together, pray together, sing together, just love one another and live together? When we're in unity, we see eye to eye. And that is what happened with the disciples. There was unanimous obedience. They went back to Jerusalem. There was unconditional oneness and unity. The prayer of the Lord had been answered concerning them. They all continued with one accord. And so as we're waiting for the promised power, as we're waiting for the Holy Ghost to come upon us, we must remember, we cannot get this power in isolation. Oh, I, I don't like the believers. I just don't like the look of their faces. I don't like the language of their mouth. I don't like the way they react to me. I will stay in my house and I will pray. I can read the Bible on my own. And I will receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit in my house. Because I'm in, this, in disagreement with the whole church. You can't have it. You can't have it. All envy must melt down. All jealousy must melt down. All disagreement must melt down. All the offenses that people have offended you, they must melt away from your heart. And there must be complete unity and agreement with the body of Christ. We must see eye to eye and be with one accord. The next point. In Acts of the Apostles, chapter 1, verse 14. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. It says they continued with one accord in prayer and supplication. This is very important. They must have learned something from the life of Jesus Christ. They must have remembered when the Holy Ghost came upon Jesus Christ. What was Jesus doing at that time? Let's see it in Luke chapter 3. Luke chapter 3, verse 21 and verse 22. Because Jesus is our master, is our Lord, is our perfect example. He also had the Holy Ghost come upon him. He was endued with power. He was anointed with the Holy Ghost and power. But what was he doing when the Holy Ghost came? Let's see in Luke chapter 3 verse 21. Now when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also being baptized and praying. Jesus also being baptized and praying, baptized with water, he was praying. The heaven opened and the Holy Ghost descended in a bodily shape like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven which said, Thou art my beloved son, in thee I am well pleased. So they saw the example from Jesus Christ. And they saw that Jesus was praying. And the Holy Ghost came. Because of that, they must follow that example. They must pray. So the Holy Ghost will come upon them as they were praying. In Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11. From verse 5. And he said unto them, Which of you shall have a friend? And shall go unto him at midnight, and say unto him, Friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine is in, a, in his journey is come to me. And I have nothing to set before him. And he from within shall answer and say, Trouble me not, the door is now shut. And my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give thee. I say unto you, 
though he will not rise and give him because he is his friend. Yet, because of his importunity, that is persistent asking, because of his persistent asking, he will rise and give him as many as he needed. Jesus gave this parable on persistent prayer, asking and asking over again, asking until you get it, and then he made the application. Look at the application that Jesus made in verse 9. And I say unto you, ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. Now let me help you. I know you don't read Greek. But the Greek for ask, knock, and seek. These words are in the present continuous, which means keep on asking. Which means ask and ask again. Seek and seek again. Knock and knock again. That's the Greek. It says, ask and keep on asking and it shall be given you. Seek and keep on seeking and you shall find. Knock and keep on knocking and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh, which means uh, in the Greek, that keeps on asking persistently, receiveth, and he that seeketh persistently findeth, and to him that knocketh persistently shall it shall be open. If a son shall ask persistently bread of any of you that is a father, will he give him a stone? If he ask a fish persistently, a fish, will he give him, will he, for a fish give him a serpent? Or if he ask persistently an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? Look at verse 13. If ye then, being evil. Know how to give good gifts unto your children. How much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? We must ask. And ask persistently. We must show we are hungry for the Holy Ghost. We are thirsty for the Holy Ghost. We must show that we really desire to have the Holy Spirit and we ask and ask persistently. And how much more shall they? Shall your heavenly Father, you must become a child of God first. Your heavenly Father will give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him persistently. And so we can see why they were praying. One from the example of Jesus, one from the teaching of Jesus. They knew they must pray if they will receive the Holy Ghost. Now we come back to Acts chapter 1. Verse 14. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication. It means they continued in prayer. They did not only pray once and stop. They continued praying. They continued making the supplication unto God so that they receive the power from on high. In Luke chapter 24, it's good for us to see these conditions so that we don't just fold our hands and sit down and refuse to read the Bible, refuse to study the Bible, and said, well, since Jesus has promised it, the Holy Ghost will come at the right time. You know, some people have that attitude. They say, well, it's the promise of the Father, and he has promised the Holy Spirit to the church, and if he wants to give us, he will give us. And they just, you know, go about their business. They will not study the Bible. As, I, as you saw me making the announcement and emphasizing it for us to come together, wait on the Lord, fulfill the condition, come to study the Bible. On Monday here in the Acts of the Apostles, some people will say, well, since the Lord has promised it, why make this much ado concerning it? Why are you making so much noise about it? If the Lord has said it will come, then it will come. Not so, my brother, my sister. There is a need for obedience, there is a need for unity and oneness, there is a need for prayer and supplication. In Luke chapter 24, I'm reading from verse 49. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. And he led them out as far as to Bethany. And he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And it came to pass, while he blessed them, he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him. And they returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. Continually in the temple. Continually in the temple. What does that mean? Now, when it says, wait for the promise of the Father, some people will think it means you get into your room and lock the door. Don't come out at all. Don't go to your place of work. 
Don't go to the kitchen. Don't come to the fellowship center. Just lock your door and just be waiting on the Lord. That's not the idea of waiting. That will be carnal. That will be leaving your responsibility. When it says wait, if there's restitution to make, you must make it. If there's apology to seek from an individual, you must seek the apology. If there, you must pray, you must read the Bible, you must come to fellowship. That is part of the waiting. They were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. And that was the idea Jesus wanted, wanted them to have on praying. And now at this time, they were not praying to Jesus, mark it. They were not praying to Jesus. They were praying to the Father. And they were praying to the Father in the name of Jesus. It was a new experience to them, I told you before. In John chapter 14. John chapter 14. I'm reading verse 13 and verse 14. Whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that I will do. That the Father may be glorified in the Son. Ask in my name. If ye shall ask anything in my name, in my name, I will do it. In verse 19. Yet a little while the world seeth me no more. That means it was going away. And ye see me because I live, ye shall live also. In that day shall ye know that I am in the Father, ye in me, and I in you. He was pointing them to a future day, a future time. Because it was to be a new experience for them in prayer. In chapter 16, verses 22 to 24. And ye now therefore have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart shall rejoice, and your joy no man taketh from you. And in that day, ye shall ask me nothing. That is it. You don't pray to Jesus directly. In that day, when I'm gone totally from you, ye shall ask me nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall ask the Father, ask the Father, ask the Father, in my name, he will give it to you. Now, you are not praying for Jesus' sake either. You know, uh, some people, when they pray, they say, we pray for Jesus' sake. You are not praying for Jesus' sake. You are praying in Jesus' name. When you pray for somebody's sake, it means you are praying for his benefit. You are not praying for his benefit. You are praying for your own benefit. But you are praying in his name. You are signing his name on your check. You are saying, I need healing. I need deliverance. I need sanctification. I need the Holy Ghost from the Father. And I need it on the authority of Jesus. I need it by the provision of Jesus. That's what it means to pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Now, let's come back to Acts chapter 1. There are many people who are praying to receive the promise of the Father. There are many people who are asking, Oh God, give me the Holy Ghost. Give me the Holy Ghost. And whenever they do not receive the Holy Spirit, they do not understand why they have not received. And they say, Well, I have prayed. I have sought the face of the Lord. And the Lord has not given me the Holy Spirit. I don't know why. The Bible is very plain and very clear. And what I read now, I want you to please take note of very seriously. It's for me and it's for you. And except we examine our hearts by the word of God, we might seek and seek and seek and we, it may take us a long time. I told you that I started seeking for the baptism in the Holy Spirit since 1966. I got that experience in 1974. Number one, I, when I was seeking, when I started seeking, the baptism in the Holy Spirit. I started seeking the Holy Spirit because many people had given testimony that uh, they spoke in tongues and I wanted it. And when I could rise up with my shoulders up as if I wanted to fly, you know, in pride, saying, I too, I have got it. Now I speak in tongues. And I never got it. I heard of Paul the Apostle. I heard of Peter. That, you know, Peter will say, silver and gold have I none, but what I have given in the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. 
I heard of Peter, and from him was taken apron, and it was put upon those having diseases and demon possessed cases, and the demon departed from them. I read that. I said, Why? Well, if I can have the Holy Ghost everywhere I go, I stand on the street corner. I see a blind man. I say, Come here, and everybody will be looking at me. I say, You blind man, receive your sight in Jesus' name, and then a person will receive his sight, and everybody will see that this is a great man of God. I never got it. You know, I will go around, and while I'm going, I remember the Bible passage that says Jesus went, he looked for fruit on the fig tree. He looked at it, and there was no fruit. He said, neither let any man eat fruit of thee anymore. And I said, if I can have that power. And I, I'll just be walking down the street, and I see a tree somewhere, just to tell people that I have, you know, the power of God, and God has chosen me to do a great work. I just stand and I say, you tree, in the name of Jesus, dry up. And it will dry up, and everybody will see that is a great man of God. I never got the Holy Ghost. I was looking for this baptism in the Holy Spirit for some time and, you know, I wanted this power so that, you know, when I had this power, I had that, you know, Peter, when he got the power, he preached and 3,000 people became converted. And I felt if I had that power, I just rise up. And I just give a message. And everybody, when they hear my message, if you hear who gave that message, you will hear so and so that gave the message. And people were crying and, you know, crying and crying, saying, what shall we do to be saved? I said, I need that power. I need that power. So when I preach like this, thousands will just be weeping. And people will ask, who gave that message? They will say, it's brother so and so. I never got it. What am I telling you? Humility is the condition for receiving the Holy Spirit. Humility. Humility. You know, the disciples were arguing when they were going on the way, who shall be the greatest among us? They were not humble. And Jesus lifted up a little child. And he said, except you be converted and you become as this little child, you will not even enter that kingdom of God. My brother, my sister, the Holy Ghost does not come on those who are proud, self-centered, arrogant, proud in their attitude, proud in their actions, proud in any way, those who look down upon other people. Humility must be within us and upon us as we're preparing to have the Holy Ghost upon our lives. After the Holy Ghost is come upon you, the Holy Spirit will empower you and God will use you, but you will pass all the glory to God. All the glory to God. And when people, when they give testimony and they mention, they mention your name, you pass the glory to God. You say, God, you know, not by power, not by might, only by your spirit. You'll be telling God, I am nothing. I feel small. There is nothing I can do in my own strength. That's when you really have the true power of God. But until you know that humility is within you, that Holy Spirit will not come upon the proud and the arrogant. Let's see Acts chapter 1. From verse 14. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication. With the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus. And with his brethren to find out that Mary, the very mother of Jesus Christ, sat among the 120 asking for the baptism in the Holy Spirit together with all the other disciples and never said a word, never made any announcement. Never said, now, I am the mother of Jesus Christ and I want everybody to listen. I want to talk to you. That's humility. That's humility. That's humility. For that mother to remain there, just a gentle mother, mild, meek, and just wonderful, just humble, never raising her voice. Never asking for Peter to come and take permission from her before Peter can talk to the crowd. That's the humility. Never asking James and John, Andrew, Bartholomew, Thomas, Matthew, and all the others to come and ask, seek direction from her, to come and worship her because she is the mother of Jesus Christ. That's the humility. And you need it. You need it. And the brethren of Jesus. You know, he had some brethren, relatives, 
children of Mary, that's what Matthew chapter 13 says, and were even given the names, James and Joseph and Jude. Now, these brethren of Jesus Christ, for them to remain in that assembly, and they never raised their voice. They never said, don't you know, we are his very brother of the same mother. Don't you know who we are? That's humility. That's humility. And in verse 15, in those days, Peter rose up in the midst of the disciples. And Peter started talking. And James did not say, Peter, please sit down. I have something to say. Uh, you are not the only one that can talk. When Jesus raised the dead, he took three of us into that room. When we, when we went to the uh, Mount of Transfiguration, I was there too because we were three, Peter, James, and John. And John never rose up to say, now, uh, everybody keep quiet. You don't have mouths to talk. I am the disciple that Jesus loved. Therefore, he gave me some revelation, some insight, and some wisdom that I want to share it with everybody. Therefore, everybody keep quiet. Oh, thank God. Thank God. If that pride had been there, the delay would have been there. The Holy Ghost will not come on the arrogant and the proud. And so if we're going to have this power, which the Lord has promised, we must have humility. One, there should be unanimous obedience. We must be in obedience together with all the body of Christ. There must be unconditional oneness and unity with the body of Christ. There must be united prayer and worship. We must keep asking. And then there must be humility. We must be clothed with humility. We must put on humility because God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. He gives grace to the humble. In James chapter 4 verse 6, but he gives more grace. Wherefore he says, he rece God resists the proud. But give us grace to the humble. Verse 10. Humble yourselves therefore in the sight of the Lord. And he shall lift you up. He shall lift you up. He will empower you if you can humble yourself in his sight. In First Peter chapter 5 verse 5. Likewise ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. Are you a house fellowship member? Be humble before your house leader. Are you a house leader? Be humble before your area leader. Are you an area leader? Be humble before your zona leader. Are you a zona leader? Be humble before the coordinator. As members of the ministry, let's be humble before one another. Let's prefer one another. Let's exalt one another. Rather than exalting yourself, promoting yourself. Rather than sitting on a high place and looking down on other people, you come down because you are just an equal together with the whole body of Christ. Let's be humble and put on this humility. These were conditions they met. And now we must quickly go through the next session. This is the scripture on a disciple. And this is special on Judas. We're going to see the scriptures for Judas, the sin for Judah, of Judas, the suicide of Judas, and the separation of Judas. Verse 16, Men and brethren, Peter said, this scripture must needs be fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spake, Concerning before concerning Judas, which was guide to them that took Jesus. Do you know that Judas have been prophesied about in the Old Testament? You say, does that mean that God made Judas to betray Jesus Christ? No, no, nothing like that. Nothing like that. Nothing like that. God never influenced Judas Iscariot to do evil. God cannot do evil. Neither does he tempt anybody with evil. God never compelled Judas to betray Jesus Christ. But God knew that Judas will betray Jesus Christ. He knew the evil that Judas will do, and he accommodated that in his plan. You know, it is like, you know that the road will go through a particular place before the road came there. And therefore, you make sure you didn't build your house on that road. Therefore, you put your road aside. You put your house at aside. God knew that Judas will do it. And um, eventually, he did it. 
as it has been prophesied. You know, there are some people that would like to feel that it was God that compelled Judas Iscariot to do it and then God sent him to hell for doing what he told him to do. Nothing like that. It was Judas that chose the evil way, the evil thing to do. And then after he did it, he must be judged because his own voluntary action was there. And Jesus said it was better that man had not been born. What's the prophecy? Where do we read the prophecy in Psalm 69, verse 25? Psalm 69, verse 25. Let their habitation be desolate, and let, and let none dwell in their tents. That's talking about Judas. You say, how do you know that? Look at verse 21. They gave me also gall for my meat. And in my thirst, they gave me vinegar to drink. That's talking about Jesus Christ. In his suffering. At his crucifixion. And what you read about in verse 25 is applied to Judas Iscariot. That you know, after he did what he did, that his habitation will be desolate. And then it says, uh, nobody will dwell in his tent. And in... Psalm 41, verse 9. Psalm 41, verse 9. Yea, mine own familiar friend in whom I trusted. We did eat of my bread, as lifted up his heel against me. That's talking about Judas Iscariot. Jesus had him as a disciple, as a familiar friend in whom he trusted. And in fact, they ate together. You remember on the Last Supper, they ate together? And it says, he has lifted up his seal against me. Psalm 109, verse 8. Let his children be fatherless. That happened when he committed suicide and died. And let his wife be a widow. That's verse 9. Now verse 8. Let his days be few. And let, his, and let another take his office. He was the twelfth apostle. Another one was to take his office, and they knew that from the scripture. They submitted themselves to the scripture, to the revealed truth in the Psalms. And now Peter said, this scripture has been fulfilled on Judas Iscariot. In verse 17, I'm now in Acts chapter 1, verse 17. For he was numbered with us, and he obtained part of this ministry. His sin is in verse 16. He was guide to them that took Jesus. You know the story very well. He betrayed the Lord. But then we're told of what happened to him. Verse 18. Now this man, Judas Iscariot, purchased a field with the reward of iniquity. And falling headlong, he burst asunder in the midst. And all his bowels gushed out. He committed suicide. And it was known... In all the, unto all the dwellers at Jerusalem, in so much as the field is called in their proper tongue a seldama. That is to say, the field of blood, for it is written in the book of Psalms, let his habitation be desolate, I've read that to you, and let no man dwell therein. And his bishopric, his ministry, his office, his apostleship, let another take. Look at verse 25, the separation of Judas that he may take part of this ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell. How did Judas fall? By transgression, by sin, by iniquity. That he might go to his own place. What does that mean, to go to his own place? Well, that's a place prepared for a traitor. What place is prepared for a traitor? Well, the same place prepared for the devil and his angels. He was separated from God forever, that he might go to his own place. Now we come to the selection of the substitute. The selection of the person to take the place of Judas Iscariot, to take his office, to take his apostleship. And in verse 21 and verse 22, we have replacing the traitor. Now it's to be replaced. Wherefore, of these men, which have accompanied with us, all the time that Jesus, that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, 
beginning from the baptism of John unto that same day that he was taken from us, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. They wanted to choose the twelve person to replace Judas Iscariot. Again, please, I want you to notice something. That already now, they were humble. They were gentle. There was no confusion, no commotion in their midst. They did everything decently and in order. You can't see any argument here. As they were going to choose the person to take the place of Judas Iscariot. You don't have any political campaign. You don't have people going around saying, choose me, choose me, choose me. I'm telling you that these people were now in real unity and humility. Something had happened in their heart. We call it sanctification, heart circumcision. There was a wonderful experience they had. If you knew these disciples before, you will know what I'm telling you. That they were all full of argument when Jesus was with them. But now, when Peter said, we must choose one, he gave out the, recomm the qualification. What were the qualification? Just three. The qualification is in three parts. Number one, somebody who has been in a company through the earthly ministry of Jesus Christ from the time of John the Baptist until Jesus was taken off. Why did, why did Peter say that? Now, please, listen. Because you have some people preaching and they tell us that the choice of Matthias was not the will of God. They said Peter made a mistake. They said he should not have chosen somebody to replace Judas Iscariot because God wanted that place to be for Paul, the apostle. But my brother, my sister, no. Nothing like that. Nothing like that. Listen. Jesus had said before he went away, you are 12. I chose you 12. He had said, the twelve of you will sit on the twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Now Paul the apostle was not an apostle to the Jews, he was an apostle to the Gentiles. He, was, he had a special apostleship. And when he wrote, he wrote to the Gentile church, and he, was always, he would always tell them, an apostle and a teacher to the Gentiles by the will of God. And he recognized the twelve apostles in Jerusalem as the, apostle that, the apostles that were sent to the circumcision. And so the choice of Matthias was according to the will of God. Now, uh, this, uh, Peter gave the qualifications. And if you look at Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22. Reading there from verse 28. That's why he got the qualification. Ye are they which have continued with me in my temptations. And I appoint unto you a kingdom as my father has appointed unto me, that ye may eat and drink at my table in the kingdom, and look at it, and sit on the thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. The twelve tribes of Israel. So the twelve must have one qualification together. And this is it. They must have continued with Jesus in all his trials and temptations. Paul wasn't there at that time, so he couldn't qualify for that. That's why Peter said he must be somebody who has continued with us all through the temptations of the trials and the persecution and the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. All through the earthly ministry of Jesus. Then number two, he must be a witness of the resurrection. An eyewitness. He must be a person that could say that Jesus was crucified. I knew it. I saw him on the cross. He must be a person that will say Jesus died and was buried and a stone was put upon his tomb. And he will say, I knew it. I saw it. I was there. He must be a person that will say Jesus rose from the dead on the third day. And he must be able to say, I saw him when he rose from the dead. And that's what Jesus Christ implied in Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24. In verse 48. And ye are witnesses of these things. Verse 46. And he said unto them, Thus it, uh, thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. And ye are witnesses of these things. And these people that will be chosen must fit the qualifications that Jesus Christ himself had given before. Number three, he must be chosen by God. 
it's not just Peter choosing the person. It's not just the disciples choosing the person. He must be chosen by God. Why? Look at chapter 6 of Luke. Luke chapter 6. I'm reading verses 12 and 13. And it came to pass in those days that he went out into a mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. And when it was day, he called unto him his disciples, and of them he chose twelve. He, the Lord, chose twelve, whom he named apostles. And so if you look at Acts chapter 1, Acts chapter 1, Verse 24, and they prayed. Why did they pray before they would choose the 12 apostles? Because Jesus prayed before he chose them. You see, everything is according to what Jesus left for them to do. They were doing everything according to the word of God because these were saved and sanctified people. And they prayed and said, Thou Lord, which knowest the hearts of all men, show whether of these thou hast chosen. Is God choosing the 12th person? And you know the Lord had said, pray, the Lord of the harvest, that he will send laborers into the harvest. Is the, is the Lord himself doing it? And so they gave the qualifications to replace the traitor. And uh, they chose two people. Let's see in, now in uh, verse 23, Acts 123. Recommending the two. And they appointed two, Joseph called Basabas, who was surnamed Justus and Matthias. These two disciples had the required qualifications and they were appointed. They were nominated. And again, please understand, these two people did not propose themselves. They did not, uh, you know, raise up their hands to say, now, I am here, you are looking for somebody who had been here since Jesus was here, you remember me? And our people can testify to that, I've been here, please. Because, you know, the name of the twelve apostles will be at the foundation of the new Jerusalem. They will sit on the twelve thrones of Israel, uh, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And yet there was no political campaign. There was no beating down other people so they can raise up themselves. Oh, no wonder that they were ready when the day of Pentecost was fully come. The Holy Ghost came upon them. But you know, in a fellowship, in a church where there is no unity, where you have this, poli this politics going on, where you have this uh, cringing going on, where you have uh, people promoting themselves, where you have all that, the Holy Ghost will not be able to fill them, empower them, and endure them with uh, anointing to be able to do the work of God. They didn't strive for office. That shows that they were really gentle and humble and meek. They simply sat still and they were appointed by other people. Other people said, oh, they, were, they are qualified. And do you know something? When Matthias was eventually chosen, Joseph, uh, who is called Basabas Justus, did not say, ah, uh -uh, so Matthias is better than myself. What does he know that I don't know? What can he do that I cannot do? All right, it is like that. And he will then brainwash some of his friends and pull away and go and start another group. No, nothing like that. Immediately they announced and said, now the Lord has finally chosen Matthias. Joseph, Joseph just said, praise the Lord, and he was quiet. He never campaigned. He never grumbled. No wonder the Spirit of God could Feel all that place. And now from verse 24. And they prayed. And they said, Thou Lord, which knowest the hearts of all men, show whether of these two thou hast chosen, that he may take part of this ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. And he gave forth their lords. You say, is that gambling? Do you pray when you gamble? Do you call on the Father in the name of Jesus when you gamble? No. They were not gambling. They were doing what the Bible had said in Proverbs chapter 16, verse 33. Proverbs 16, verse 33. The Lord is cast into the lap, but the whole disposing thereof is of the Lord. This is serious praying. 
because they said the Lord you know the hearts of all men please choose whichever one you want among these two and they gave their lot and the lot fell upon Matthias and he was numbered with the eleven apostles these are the days of waiting for the promised power and I've told you that these disciples who are waiting they submitted completely unto the Lord I told you the conditions they fulfilled unanimous obedience and if you are waiting for the baptism of the Holy Ghost upon your life upon your soul upon your spirit you must have that there must be unanimous obedience are you obeying the Lord what he told you to do in your life what you have read in the scripture if the scripture says forgive everyone that has offended you are you forgiven if it says bear no grudge are you not bearing grudge if it says pray for your enemies are you praying for your enemies if it says be humble be yielded in the hand of the lord are you doing that if he says that you must do good to enemies are you doing it if he tells you to make restitution are you doing it there must be unanimous obedience before the holy ghost will come there must be unconditional oneness and unity are we united really united if you are united why are you not in fellowship with the believers in your zone in your area in your in your all's fellowship why are you the lone ranger walking alone is it not because of pride there must be oneness and unity and then there must be prayer and worship there must be persistent asking from the lord oh no it's not the pastor here going to give you the holy ghost john the baptist said i truly baptize with water but he that is coming after me is greater than myself he the lord jesus christ shall baptize you with the holy ghost and fire and then he says that i will go to the father and the father will send his promise upon you it's not a man going to baptize you in the holy ghost it's the lord jesus christ himself and you must pray and ask for it then there must be humility if we have all these conditions we are saved we've settled our lives with the lord and we are obedient and united with the people and we are praying and we are humble the holy spirit will come in due time and god will fill your life and your soul and your heart with the holy ghost from above and it will empower you for service because it says ye shall receive power after the holy ghost has come upon you and we are waiting and i believe that jesus is still faithful god is still faithful that holy ghost will come as we fulfill the conditions rise up and let us pray Surrender yourself to the Lord. Let pride go away. Let place seeking go away. Let disagreement go away. Let all discord go away. Become humble and united with the people of God. And be sincere. Be thirsty and be hungry. For the Holy Ghost in your life. You need Him to empower you, to give you boldness and power, faith and wisdom, revelation and glory. You need him. He'll give you insight to the scriptures when you have him. And yet he says, you wait, you wait, you tarry in Jerusalem until ye be endured with power from on high. 